Many students engage in behaviors that are deemed to be inappropriate in the school or any other environment. These challenging or problem behaviors may be one of the reasons why students may receive special education services, as is the case of students who have an emotional or behavior disorder. Let's quickly review the behavioral characteristics of students who have an EBD. Many students with EBD often experience great difficulty in making and keeping friends. Students are often found to be out of their seat, running around the room, disturbing peers, hitting, fighting, ignoring the teacher, complaining excessively, stealing, destroying property, arguing, distorting the truth, and so forth. Some children are anything but aggressive, so they're the opposite. Their problem is that they have too little social interactions with others. They seldom play with children their own age. They lack many social skills to make and keep friends. They also may retreat into daydreaming, are fearful of things without reason, frequently complain of being sick or hurt, and go into deep bouts of depression. Functional assessment is basically a process that allows you to understand the function or the purpose of the student's behavior. Functional assessment allows you to look beyond the behavior to uncover the communicative message. What is the behavior communicating? And then what is meant by the function? The function of a behavior is the payoff that the individual receives by engaging in the behavior. Think of it, but think of it like this. All behavior occurs for a reason. Without a reason, there would be no behavior. We complete an FBA to determine the relationship between the behavior and the environment to find the maintaining variables. Our goal is to change behavior. And to change behavior, we need to develop a behavior intervention or support plan. FBA is a system for gathering information about the antecedents and the consequences of behavior, and we'll talk about those in just a little bit, developing a hypothesis about the function of the behavior, which is your best guess about why the behavior is occurring, and then implementing a behavior intervention plan where we identify and teach a replacement behavior. If we can identify the function or what it is the child is getting out of engaging in the behavior, then we can identify and we can teach a socially appropriate way for the individual to communicate. We don't want to extinguish or get rid of a socially inappropriate or challenging behavior without replacing it first because it's serving a function for that individual. Traditionally, we have learned to deal with inappropriate behavior by using general interventions. For instance, if a child were to do something that he or she was not supposed to do, he would be placed in timeout regardless of the function of the behavior. But now with PBS, we're now matching the intervention to the purpose of the child's behavior. Without determining the function of a child's behavior, the types of interventions were typically reactive in nature. They were applied after the child had engaged in negative behavior in an effort to deliver a powerful enough consequence so that the child would not do that behavior again. So in other words, they were more punitive and they were supposed to be punishing. But PBS uses a proactive approach. Most of the power in the intervention approach is preventing the behavior from occurring in the first place. Reactive strategies they do provide a quick fix in getting the child to not use the challenging behavior. The problem with these kinds of approaches is that they do not respond to what the child is attempting to achieve when they use the challenging behavior. So in positive behavior supports, challenging behavior is viewed as meeting a need for the child. Children use challenging behavior because they lack more appropriate social or communication skills to get their needs met. So the PBS approach involves strategies that move beyond the quick fixes and are long-term interventions. They're interventions that give children new skills to use, and they may take time. 
Learning a new skill takes a lot of time, but the child is also more likely to sustain it over time because they no longer need to use the challenging or inappropriate behavior that was meeting their needs. The mandate requires that schools must perform an FBA for any student who is at risk for suspension for up to 10 days, for any student undergoing a change of placement to a more restrictive setting, and for any student whose behavior is impeding his or her learning or the learning of others, or when restrictive interventions are going to be used with the individual. So legally, these are the times when you must perform an FBA. Professionally, as a teacher, you should perform an FBA anytime you encounter a behavior that resists change when a behavior appears to be random, or when a behavior socially isolates an individual, or when you just can't seem to understand it at all. Most importantly, you should professionally perform an FBA any time the behavior impacts the individual or the family's quality of life. Why should we conduct an FBA? FBAs help us understand the behavior and develop more effective behavior intervention plans. So without this process, the student's behavior would probably get worse, and chances are it would not improve on its own. The process also helps improve programming for students whose behavior interferes with their own learning and the learning of others. We know that negative or punitive measures that have been used in the past, they don't work. Also, if we don't do an FBA, we may be in violation of the law if there is a formal complaint made to the state, mediation, or due process. Let's think about the outcomes of an FBA. An FBA helps us more accurately predict when behavior is going to occur and prevent future outbursts. So, when the hypothesis about the function of the behavior is correct, we get ideas about different skills, alternative or replacement skills, that we can teach. We teach new behaviors that meet that same function for the individual, and this results in long-term behavior change, which amounts to a happier student, happier teachers. Together, PBS and FBA, they're holistic. It's a holistic approach that considers all of the factors that impact a child, a family, and the child's behavior. So who does an FBA? The IEP team, which includes the parents, completes the FBA. When meeting as a team, meet at times that are convenient for the family. You'll always want to de-jargon the process so that everyone is on the same page and understands. Be sure to set up the environment and to arrange the room to facilitate equal exchanges between all of the team members. Be sure to be clear about starting and ending times. It's also a good idea to begin the meeting by stating the goals and the agenda. Some things the team may want to consider when going through the FBA process include, one person should not be responsible for gathering all of the information and conducting the FBA. However, one person may be the case manager and oversee and coordinate the process. It is also important to consider who will be collecting the information, who will be responsible for summarizing and displaying the information, when and how often will the information be collected, and who will meet, when and how often to review and discuss the information for decision making. Specific, specifying and outlining this information with the team helps outline an action plan so that everyone involved is aware of their responsibilities. Are you thinking to yourself, why do students use challenging or problem behavior? Well, children engage in challenging behavior because it works for them. Behavior can ser serve a number of functions for a student. There are four categories of functions of behavior that have been empirically validated. An easy way to remember the functions of behavior is with the acronym SEAT, like you're sitting on a chair. And this stands for sensory, escape, attention, and tangible. It's important to know that some behaviors that children engage in may serve more than one function. For example, a child could be hitting for multiple reasons. They could be hitting to gain attention, to escape a situation, and maybe for control. 
It's also true that different behaviors may serve the same function. A student may throw a pencil, they may tantrum, or they may talk out and refuse something all for attention. We, together, we have to gather as much information about when, where, and why the behavior occurs to help us understand why negative behavior occurs, to help us identify the correct function and develop appropriate behavior support plans. Identifying what the student gets out of engaging in a specific behavior is critical when trying to develop meaningful consequences. When thinking about the alternative replacement behaviors that you want to teach, it has to be easier for the student to engage in and it has to be more effective for the student and it must serve the same function. So what are the ABCs of behavior? When observing behavior, it's important to identify what happens right before the behavior. An antecedent is anything that happens right before the behavior occurs. A consequence is anything that occurs immediately following the behavior. A consequence can increase the likelihood that the behavior will occur again in the future, or a consequence can be provided and in turn decreases the chance of the behavior occurring again in the future. We just talked about the ABCs. Now let's talk about the importance of defining the actual behavior that the student engages in. When defining behaviors, the target behavior needs to be observable and measurable so that everyone can see the same understanding of what the behavior looks like when it occurs. For instance, is the term aggression objective? What does aggression mean to you? I bet whatever your definition is, is different than the definition that I have, and that's because behavior is subjective. So, we objectively define the target behavior using observable and measurable, measurable terms so that anyone, even a stranger, can identify when a student is engaging in the behavior. So every behavior happens for a reason. We need to think of behavior as, as being communication. It's our job then as teachers when performing an FBA to identify the function or the purpose of the behavior. When we do an FBA, it allows us to systematically break down the behavior to identify why it continues to occur. In the first step of the process, the team together picks and identifies one behavior to focus on. As we just covered, the behavior needs to be defined in a very clear and measurable terms so that someone unfamiliar with the student would know what to look for if they were told to walk into the classroom. After the behavior has been identified and defined, the team gathers information on the behavior through direct observation so people go in and they actually observe the student and get to watch the behavior. Interviews with others familiar with the student, with any assessments and reviews other information, supports or interventions that may have been put in place. And this lets us know what has been tried in the past. With all of the information, the team looks for patterns in the information and data to attempt to identify a reason why the student is using his or her behavior. Sometimes this takes a lot of detective work. The team develops their best guess or hypothesis about the behavior and why it is occurring. Finally, after the team identifies why the behavior is occurring, they together come up with a plan detailing the supports and interventions that will be implemented to teach the child a replacement, more appropriate, pro-social behavior. As a team, you will need to create a systematic plan to teach the new behavior because the student will not just pick up on the new skill or behavior on his or her own, and not everyone working with the student will know how to support the student when the behavior occurs, unless there's a plan that is shared with each person. The replacement behavior that we come up with must be carefully considered to ensure that the students will see it as a positive alternative to the inappropriate behavior. First, replacement behaviors need to be relevant. We may want to consider how successful students and peers behave in the environment and what they would do under similar circumstances. Second, replacement behaviors must be more effective than the problem behavior. If the decision is between an inappropriate behavior that works really well and that the student has used for a really long time, 
and a replacement behavior that does not, the student will always continue to use the challenging or problem behavior because it works. Thirdly, replacement behaviors must be at least as efficient as the problem behavior. If the replacement behavior works but requires a good deal of effort or works much more slowly than the problem behavior, the student is likely to return to the more efficient problem behavior. So, if it works but it's harder to perform, the student won't use it. One of the main goals from the FBA is to develop a behavior support plan or a plan that is put into place to support the student and teach the newly identified replacement behavior. Behavior support plans include the following components. Statements that include a description about the behavior, including the antecedents most often associated with the behavior, the consequences and the perceived function or reason why the child is exhibiting the behavior. Again, this is a positive process so the student's strengths and abilities are included so that we can build off of those strengths. Also, you want to include all previously used interventions so that the team has an idea of what has and has not worked in the past. The behavior support plan includes the new skill or replacement behavior that will replace the inappropriate behavior and the plan on how to teach the new behavior. Think about this for a moment. Which behavior, screaming or raising your hand, is faster? Well, screaming. Which behavior would be answered more consistently? Screaming again. Which behavior is easier? Screaming. So why not choose the inappropriate behavior? It's the behavior that gets a response faster, with more consistency, and is easier to perform. Thinking about it this way helps to understand why children use inappropriate behavior. Each time they get a response, the behavior is strengthened, and the chances of them behaving the same way in the future is increased. We need to teach the socially appropriate behavior in this case it would be raising the hand, and have it have the same outcomes as the inappropriate behavior to have a lasting effect for the child. The behavior support plan is a carefully developed plan, strategies that may be used to reduce the likelihood of the child engaging in the inappropriate behavior specified and listed out, reactions the team members may make to the behavior or ways to respond to the child in ways that will not reinforce or maintain the behavior are also integrated and if restricted interventions or any crisis interventions are deemed necessary then the exact plan for implementation must be included in the support plan. Methods for evaluation and measurement criteria are also agreed upon by all members and this is really important because we need to know if the strategies or supports that we're putting in place are effective. And probably one of the most important factors to ensure success of the child is the communication of the support plan between all environments and all of the people in which the child interacts with. Let's review briefly. We write in FBA so that we can define the behavior in a way that everyone who supports the child would know what it looks like when the behavior occurs, why the behavior happens, and what to do when it does happen. The behavior support plan specifies a plan so that everyone working with a child knows how to respond when the child engages in the behavior and how to support and teach the replacement behavior. Behavior continues to occur because it's reinforced. When we take a look at the environment in which the behavior occurs, we can determine what it is the child is getting out of using the behavior or the function underlying its use. Remember, our goal is to make challenging behavior less effective and less efficient and instead make the replacement or the desired behavior more functional.